All right, let's go. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the NEA Big Read kickoff event and Lab Blitz. Um, my name is Chelsea. Um, if we haven't met before, I'm a museum educator here at the Florida Museum, and I'm so excited to introduce you to our very first of a series of events we're hosting with our partners from the Alachua County Library District. Um, Jasmine here has been my fearless partner in planning these events. Um, Jasmine, do you wanna say hi to everyone? I'd love to say hi, Chelsea. Um, can you guys see me okay? Yes, awesome. So we are so excited to be partnering up with the museum over this super great project. I wanted to highlight some couple things that the library is doing right now, which we are doing curbside service for library renewals and checkouts. And for any new library card holders, you will be getting a new free read poster. So please stop by your local branch to get a new library card if you want, and we'll be so happy to see you. Awesome, thanks Jasmine. Um, for anyone who knows me knows that I'm a huge fan of the Lafayette County Library, which is exactly why I sought them out when we um, were looking for a partner for this program. Um, so a little bit more about the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read. Um, so this is a series of free events that we're doing to build community in Alachua County um, to uplift the stories of women in science. Um, so starting today, we'll be running events all the way until spring 2021. Um, so this dynamic program will explore the memoir um, Lab Girl by the award-winning author Hope Jaren. Um, that's, so that's our main book for this program for adults. But we also have added some additional children's books for this program, including Swimming with Sharks, um, Evelyn, The Adventurous Entomologist, and Finding Wonders. Um, I finished reading all of these books this week after we got them in, and I have to say they are very awesome and very exciting and beautiful illustrations. Um, if you're interested in following for um, signing up for our other events in this series, um, we'll talk a little bit more about those at the end. Um, but these are some links for those programs. Um, and I believe um, some helpers are going to help me put those links in the chat so you can click them for yourself as well. Um, so now that we've done, you know, a little bit of that housekeeping, um, I did want to tell you guys a little bit more about how a webinar works. Um, so today you're going to be meeting four of our awesome museum scientists who are super excited to share their stories of science and show off some surprises um, where their work happens, um, both in the lab and in the field. Um, and then during the last portion of this event, we're going to take questions from all of you. Um, so you'll notice right now you're muted with your cameras off. Um, this is because we're using a Zoom webinar feature. Um, the chat option will remain open throughout the event, so please use that respectfully. Um, if you have a question for a scientist, you can go ahead and submit that through the chat throughout the program, um, but make sure you're addressing it to all panelists and hosts so that other people in attendance can see your questions too. Um, as we've already done, we'll be popping up some more um, polls throughout this event. Um, barring I can remember to do them all. <laughs> um, and I can see you've already been participating in the first poll, which is awesome. And I see lots of you love learning about science, but aren't scientists yourself. Um, but maybe even this program, you'll learn that, may, that maybe you are already a scientist and you just don't even know it. Um, we also have some budding scientists here, which is super exciting. Um, so when the program ends, you're going to be prompted with a survey. Um, this survey is super important for us to continue hosting these events. It's going to ask you questions about how you enjoyed it, what you want to see in future events, things like that. Um, so this would help us immensely as we continue to offer free programming as part of the big read. Um, and if you missed that survey in the chat or at the end, we're also going to send it to your email inbox tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and with that, I would like to introduce to you our scientists, starting with Pam. Pam, do you want to say hi and tell everyone who you are? <laughs> sure. Thanks, Chelsea. Hi, everyone, and thanks for spending your afternoon with us. My name is Pam Soltis, and I'm a curator here at the Florida Museum of Natural History. My research specialty is plant diversity, and I study how the world's half million species are related to each other and how new species form. Awesome. Um, Nicole, do you want to say hi? Hi, thanks Chelsea. I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm an archaeologist and my field of study is in zooarchaeology, which is a study of animal remains from archaeological sites. And I am the collections manager here in environmental archaeology at the museum. Awesome. Sarah. Hi everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. My name is Sarah Steele Cabrera 
and I am an entomologist and an ecologist. Entomology is the study of insects. Um, here at the Florida Museum of Natural History, I am a PhD student and graduate research assistant. Um, mainly my work focuses on the conservation and ecology of butterflies with a focus of, on South Florida. And Carmi. Great, thanks Chelsea. Um, my name is Carmi, I'm a paleontologist, which means that I study animals that lived a very, very long time ago on our planet. I focus on animals without backbones or invertebrates, and my research focuses broadly on the marine paleoecology of organisms in the southeastern United States and circum-Caribbean. And I'm a research assistant and collection specialist in the invertebrate paleontology division at the Florida Museum of Natural History. Awesome. Thank you, Carmi. And you guys all might see I put a new poll up there. So maybe you guys can see what you think is so cool about being a scientist. Um, so on your screen, you should see now an image of the wonderful Florida Museum of Natural History. If you've ever been here before, you've walked through those doors. If you were here today, you would have seen a line at those doors because it's super busy packed Saturday here for us. Um, but this is the outside of our museum. Um, if you've ever walked around the back of the museum, you would have seen this beautiful plant garden, this crazy big structure full of butterflies, um, and maybe also these windows around back here. So this building kind of attached to us in the back is called the McGuire Center for Lepidoptera. And this is where our scientists study Lepidoptera, which means butterflies and moths. So this is where Sarah is actually today. Uh, and if you've been inside, you've probably also walked past this window and maybe seen some people in there doing science. Um, and that's exactly where Sarah is sitting right now. So if you've ever seen this room from this angle, um, you'll be able to see um, from the scientist's view as you um, when we get to Sarah's portion. Um, some of you, probably less of you maybe, have seen this building, um, which is on the University of Florida campus. This is the Dickinson Hall of Research and Collections. Um, and this building with plants growing all over it is where most of our other scientists are currently doing their research um, when they're in their labs. So in this building, we have everything from plants to um, frogs to birds to um, fossils to archaeological specimen, all kinds of really, really awesome stuff is inside this building. And this is where um, Nicole is sitting today in the Environmental Archaeology Lab. You might think when you see this photo that these people look like they're sitting a little close to each other and they don't have their masks on. Um, and that's because this photo was taken actually before we were in this crazy pandemic. Um, but this is awesome. Lots of work gets done in this room. You'll get to see some of these boxes um, with some cool stuff in it when we get to Nicole's portion. So super exciting. Um, this is Invertebrate Paleontology Lab. You'll see a similar kind of um, funky looking ceiling there. That's because all of these labs are inside of that crazy looking building. So this is what it actually looks like inside. And a lot of science, a lot, a lot of science goes on here and it's super awesome. Um, and then this last lab here that I'm going to show you is the molecular lab. And this is where Pam Soltis is sitting right now. Um, and you can see she's got all kinds of tools and gadgets and lots of things that I don't quite know how they work, but I think Pam's going to tell us about a few of them now. Um, Pam, do you want to go ahead and get us started? Oh, Pam, we can't quite hear you yet. Oh, I unmuted. Sorry. There you go. There. Does that work now? Yep, all good. Okay, great. Um, so I thought maybe I'd start by um, just telling you a little bit about why I became a scientist. And um, um, so, 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 and I loved rocks and collecting things. And when I was little, I think about the age of seven, my parents gave me a book entitled Marvels of the Earth. I still remember this book. And it was all about rocks. And my dad built me a lab bench that we put in the basement. And my parents gave me a geology set complete with a Bunsen burner. And I was able to sit in my basement and crack rocks and um, basically figure out what those rocks were made of to my heart's content. But eventually I realized that some rocks had fossils in them and that that was really cool. So I started collecting fossils. So I had piles of rocks, piles of fossils. And soon I realized that I was more interested in the fossils than I was in the rocks themselves. Now, during this time, I also toyed with the idea of being a marine biologist, but growing up in the middle of Iowa was not really conducive to being a marine biologist. So I sort of gave that up. 
So let's fast forward another year or two. And I started spending my summers working in the Iowa cornfields doing something called detasseling. Well, today this process is actually done by machines, but 50 years ago, it was done by middle school and high school students. So basically detasseling is part of the process of making hybrid corn and hybrid corn is what farmers want to plant. So at the age of 13, I realized I was doing genetics and I'm pretty sure I was the only kid out there who was actually interested in what we were actually doing in the science of what we were doing. So eventually I learned more about genetics and crosses and Mendel and I realized that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a geneticist and a plant geneticist. But I still loved fossils and the history of life. So in graduate school, I found a way to combine these things into a way that I could study plant diversity and evolution, all based on genetics. And so here I am 50 years later after those detasseling experiences, loving every minute of this. Thank you, Pam. Thank you, thank you so much. And I realized I, I made this awesome outline and I actually skipped over a really important part of it. So we're gonna go back here a second because um, I'm really interested in hearing a little bit from our scientists about their origin stories. So I kind of am interested in hearing a little bit about what got you into science as Pam just told us now, her story. Um, Sarah, will you tell us a little bit about what got you into science? Yeah, thanks Chelsea. Um, so as a kid, like a lot, of, a lot of kids, I spent a lot of time outside in nature, in the woods, but I don't think my science moment, science origin story really happened until college. Um, although I loved playing outdoors, I didn't realize that one could actually have a career in ecology until taking a class as a sophomore um, in conservation biology. And as part of that course, we got to go outside in the woods in New England, um, near where I grew up. And we started learning the names of all the plants and trees that I had grown up seeing and playing in and loving, but not really knowing anything about them. Um, and so that was a really big aha moment that there were things to be learned. Um, and then as part of that course, I learned a, a lot about other scientists and that that one can have a job doing this and be employed and get to travel to lots of cool places to do ecology. And so that really inspired me to go and work a bunch of different seasonal field jobs after, during and after college. So I got to travel to places like Costa Rica and the Caribbean and New Mexico. Um, and I lived on a ship for a little bit and studied all sorts of things. Um, including plants and sea turtles, and really was loving it, but didn't have a lot of focus. And then um, really, I, I didn't start studying insects until just a few years ago, um, and I've really fallen in love with it since. I think insects are fascinating, one, because they are just so abundant. Insects are literally everywhere, especially here in Florida, and they are connected to everything. Um, Insects are connected to plants, they're connected to a lot of processes and are so important for humans as well. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about how I got to be where I am. That's awesome, thank you, Sarah. Um, Nicole, do you mind telling us a little bit about what got you into science? Sure, um, so I'm sort of the opposite of Sarah. My science moment started with bugs. So, and insects. So uh, when I was in about the fourth grade, I was homeschooled and we were reading in our textbooks about um, insect galls, which are these sort of blisters that insects will form on the leaves of, of plants and trees. And so when we noticed that uh, we had these in some trees in our yard, I went outside and we started like breaking them open to see what was in there. And these weird little orange insects started crawling out of them. And I was just like, what's going on? And so from there, I just started to um, look at more insects in our yard. I started collecting them and bringing them in the house um, in jars and, and mostly caterpillars and um, feeding them and seeing what they would turn into. And then I would, would let them go after I figured out what they were. Um, I got a field guide and started to identify more insects. And it just from there, it went to um, my family giving me things like chemistry sets and experiment books for kids. So they really were instrumental in, in fostering my interest in science. And, and after that, um, I had a lot of different career changes. So I too initially lacked some focus. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian for a while, but tried out working in a vet office. 
Um, so that didn't quite work out. And then it wasn't until my junior year of undergrad that I found anthropology and found archaeology and found this museum. And so that was really the sticking point for me, um, starting out in, in archaeology and zooarchaeology in this museum. That's awesome. Thank you, Nicole. Um, it may be a sign for anyone who has kids bringing bugs in the house that maybe it'll lead to a career choice in the future. <laughs> um, Carmi, do you want to tell us a little bit about your origin story in science? Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Chelsea. So I was very excited to be a part of this event because I feel it combines two of my very early childhood interests, which were libraries and museums. So I lived outside of Washington, D.C. for five or six years as a child. And in those early years, my mom would take us on the metro to the National Museum, and she would take us to lots of different library programs. Um, and afterwards, I would check out tons of books on herpetology and rocks and minerals and any kind of aspect of natural history. I was fascinated by it. I found it so engaging. Um, but I never really had the language for that kind of interest, so I didn't know that was an actual career that you could pursue. I was kind of familiar with archaeology, and I thought about being an archaeologist in elementary school. And I remember coming home and telling my father about it. I was so excited. And he said, no, you're not going to be an archaeologist. There's no money in history. There's no money in archaeology. There are no jobs. So just give that up. I said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> the real job is this, like doctor, engineer. Um, and I kind of resigned myself to that, even though I struggled a lot in my mathematics courses and in my science courses, even though I found the material interesting, there was never a connection in my brain. Um, so I went to college pursuing a pre-medical track because, you know, doctor's a good, stable career and that's kind of the way to go. And I hated it. Um, I didn't like the advisor I was with. I felt utterly miserable. So I said, you know, I'm going to finish my degree early. I'm going to leave and just find a job and live out the rest of my days. So while taking a summer course kind of by accident, it was an intro to geology, I was sitting the first day of lecture, the professor was talking about different earth system processes and suddenly everything made sense. So all the chemistry classes and the physics classes and whatnot um, had a logical connection for me. So when it was applied to the story of the earth around us, I said, oh yeah, this makes sense. Why didn't people just say that these are all connected together sooner? Um, and I started to realize that, oh, science is a narrative. It's another way of storytelling. So in English and literature, you use words and sentences and paragraphs. And in science, we use our different data and observations to construct a similar sort of thing. Um, and I've kind of continued on that path ever since. I said, OK, maybe I'll try this paleontology thing out. And then I found myself at the National Museum for a little bit after graduation. And I kind of meandered my way down to Florida. And I've been here ever since. And I feel very fortunate to be in a position that combines my passion for research with also preservation and, and maintaining resources for the generations to come. So inspirational. Thank you, Carmi. Um, so since I've already shown you guys kind of the outside of their labs and a little bit of what it looks like inside, um, we're now going to go back to showing off some of the stuff that you might see that's kind of behind them that you guys have been curious about. Um, so according to our polls here, I can see that all of you think that um, there are lots and lots of cool parts of being a scientist and you are absolutely correct. So yeah, scientists get to do all of those things listed there in the poll. And, um, and I'm going to let our scientists tell you a little bit more about them. Um, Pam, do you think you're ready to share your slides? Sure. Yeah, that would be great. Awesome. Then I will make that happen. <laughs> great. Thanks. Well, I just want to start out by saying that I love my job. So I'm talking to you from my lab in Gainesville, but my work has taken me across the US and Canada to Central America, South America, Europe, and Asia. And my research involves three main things. First of all, field work, like you can see here. And here we collect plant samples, then we take them back to the lab and we do lab work where we extract and analyze DNA. And then we spend a lot of time analyzing data on the computer. So, um, and, right, so we do a lot of things with uh, molecular information. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a curator and that's the faculty title that we use in the museum. 
Now, some of you may not be familiar with that term, but it's equivalent to professor, which might be a more familiar term to um, most of you. But curator actually refers to the fact that we take care of specimens and artifacts in addition to these other faculty roles. So I curate a collection of about 80,000 samples of DNA and tissue that are frozen in super cool, very, very cold freezers. And these samples are used by our own museum scientists, but we also share them with other scientists from around the world. Now I started collecting things when I was really little, as I mentioned before. So caring for collections is really a perfect job for me. And I think this is true of our other, of all of our curators and collections staff at the museum and our other panelists here today as well. Now I have a few items that I'd like to share here with you to illustrate how I do my work. Now, the first thing that I wanted to show has to do with some of the equipment that we take with us when we go out in the field. And we always have with us a plant press. Now, you may be familiar with plant presses. They're really popular for pressing wildflowers, for example. Now, we press samples of all of the plants that we collect. And um, in addition, we'll also collect samples for um, DNA analysis. Sometimes we collect samples for chemical analysis. Sometimes we even collect samples of the soil that the plants are growing in so we can understand a little bit more about the habitat. In addition, we record lots of information. We record the species name, where the collection was made, the date of the collection, we indicate who all was involved in making the collection and so on. So we use our plant press as I just showed you and we take a plant and we put it between sheets of newspaper and then we put this plant inside of our press and we dry it and that sample may stay and may dry just fine just in the plant press but sometimes we need to use some special ovens to help um, dry the material so once the plant is dried then it's mounted on a sheet of special paper and we have beautiful herbarium specimens that result from that. So can I have the next slide, please? And here you see just a couple of examples. Now, from these um, specimens, we get all sorts of information. We can see beautifully what the plant looks like. The one on the left is a pitcher plant. It's called the purple pitcher plant, and it occurs in Florida. It's a carnivorous plant, in fact, um, it actually ingests various sorts of animals, insects, sometimes even small frogs. So these plants need to get some of their nutrients actually from animals rather than just um, through photosynthesis. The plant on the right is a red maple. That's a very common plant that occurs throughout Eastern North America. Now we have so much information on these specimens. Down in the lower right corner, we have the label and the label tells us all of that information that I mentioned before, who collected it, what the scientific name is, where it's from, the date it was collected, all of those sorts of things. But then we can also measure things on the specimens themselves, like aspects of the leaves or the flowers. We can even take pieces off of a specimen and use those pieces to analyze DNA or chemistry. It's even possible to learn what fungi or bacteria might be on the surface of the plants or growing inside the leaves. And in the case of the pitcher plant, we can sometimes even figure out what insects might be down inside those pitchers by cutting open, slicing open the pitcher and taking um, a closer look there. So we have so much information that we can get from our herbarium specimens. Well, after we make our collections in the field, we return to the lab. And I have a few lab items to share with you now. So we have special tubes where we store DNA. Those are placed here. And we have special pipetters with tips that we can use to transfer DNA and other solutions um, in and out of these tubes. And these are also the sorts of tubes that those 80,000 samples of DNA in our frozen collection are kept in. So in our work, we're building the family tree of plants, one little bit at a time. 
Now, just like all of us have our own family trees, species in nature are also part of a big family tree that we call the tree of life. And one of the groups that our lab is working on is the mint family. Now, you're all familiar with certain species or types of mints like spearmint, peppermint, um, herbs like basil and oregano, rosemary and thyme. But this is a family that's much more diverse than just those herbs and spices. In fact, there are over 7,000 species in the mint family. And within this mint family, we also have woody species like shrubs, like the beautyberry, which is one of those um, plants that right now has these beautiful little purple fruits on it. And also there are trees like teak from which we make furniture um, that are also in the mint family. So you might be wondering why we're building this plant family tree. What, what will it tell us? Why do we spend all of this time and effort doing this? Well, understanding how species are related to each other can really help us solve a lot of problems. First of all, we can understand how new species form. Once we understand how they're related, we can make hypotheses and do tests about how new species originate. We can also learn about how species adapt to their environment. And certainly in a time when we're witnessing this rapid period of climate change, we, um, it's really great to be able to have these resources that can help us see how plants have adapted over longer periods of time to help us understand how they might be able to respond to climate change. Now we can also apply this information in other ways for human well-being. So knowledge of species relationships is really crucial for finding new medicines and for crop improvement and for conservation. Now, I don't do any of this work alone. In fact, I actually work with my husband. And together, we have a large team of students and staff who work in our lab. We also have a lot of partners from all around the world, from Europe, South America, China, Japan, Korea. Uh, we work with people in lots of different areas. So basically, our work is sort of like a team sport. So these are some of the tools that we use in our work, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have a little bit later in our presentation. Thank you so much, Pam, that was amazing. Um, and so you talked a little bit about um, plant interactions, and Sarah mentioned this earlier about how plants interact with other things in our whole tree of life. Um, so I'm wondering if Sarah will wanna take over and tell us a little bit about her work with um, Lepidoptera and butterflies. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. Um, so as, as we mentioned, I mainly work with butterflies, um, which are part of the group called Lepidoptera. So that includes butterflies and moths, which are very similar. And right now I'm here in Gainesville in my lab in the Florida Museum of Natural History. But a lot of the time you'll be able to find me in the field. So uh, mainly I work in the Florida Keys where I am in that photograph. Um, and the Florida Keys are a really interesting place to study butterflies because there are several species of butterflies as well as many other animals that are really found nowhere else in the US and oftentimes nowhere else in the world. Um, and so we work with a few of these species of butterflies here in my lab, um, which is run by Dr. Jarrett Daniels. Um, and so in pre-pandemic times, you'll often see several people in this lab working to raise and feed caterpillars. Uh, next slide. So this is a photo of one of those butterflies. That's the Miami blue butterfly, which is only found in the Florida Keys and is endangered. So in this lab, we raise butterflies, thousands of butterflies um, to reintroduce into areas of the wild where they used to be to hopefully keep them from going extinct. And I actually have a caterpillar um, of this butterfly here with me today. <clears throat> um, and this is what they look like, this little green guy turns into a butterfly, although it is rather a small butterfly. So small butterfly, small caterpillar. Um, next slide. And so one of my favorite things about my job is getting to work in the beautiful places where these butterfly live. So that includes these islands um, that are west of Key West. Um, and I have one more photo as well of, the, of what these islands look like. So thank you, Chelsea. Um, so one of my favorite things is that I actually get to take a boat to these islands and look for the Miami blue butterfly in its natural habitat, um, which I am super fortunate to get to be able to do. 
Uh, next slide. And another butterfly we work with here in the Daniels lab is called the Shouse Swallowtail. So this butterfly is also only found in the Florida Keys, but unlike the Miami Blue that is found on beaches, this butterfly is found in forests. So I actually have one of these caterpillars with me as well today. It's a little easier to see. <clears throat> so you'll see that this caterpillar, it's kind of dark and white. And what that's actually doing is this butterfly is camouflaged as bird poop. So if you're a bird flying in the forest and you see this caterpillar, you might be fooled that it's just poop. Um, and maybe if you're the caterpillar, you're hoping that you're not being eaten. Um, and so right now this shell swallowtail caterpillar is feeding on one of its host plants. So a host plant is the plant that the big female butterfly lays her eggs on and then that the caterpillar eats. This is a wild lime, um, which is in the same family as our citrus fruits. So our oranges and grapefruits. Um, and then one last slide here. So I just showed you those slides of those beautiful islands, but not all field work is butterflies and rainbows. Sometimes it's butterflies and mosquitoes. So this is a photo here of my coworker's hand. Um, he's holding a shell swallowtail in the photo. You see that butterfly that he's holding with his two fingers with its wings closed. So he's able to actually hold the butterfly, uh, a live butterfly without hurting it by holding its wings closed like that. And another thing you'll see is that this butterfly has some numbers on it. Um, this butterfly is number 38. And by writing on butterflies, this is just with a regular Sharpie here, we can actually keep track of individual butterflies and estimate population sizes using a technique that's called mark release recapture. Um, but this island where this rare butterfly is found um, is also home to bajillions of mosquitoes. Um, so anytime you take a glove off, this is what will happen to your hand. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm sure we'll have lots more questions about those caterpillars. Um, it's always awesome to have um, live critters on our Zoom calls. <laughs> so that was awesome. Um, all right, so Nicole, do you want to show us some of the stuff that you have going on in your environmental archaeology lab? Sure. And if you'll share the slides, you can. Yep, I'm on my way. We might have to see those mosquitoes again real quick. All right, <laughs> and now back to Nicole. <laughs> okay. So like the other scientists here as a zooarchaeologist, um, my work is also in the field and in the lab. Um, so that's just a photo of me in the field doing some excavation. Um, and my research is based on the Georgia coast on an island called St. Catharines. And I study animal remains from two archaeological sites called shell rings. And next slide. And these sites are around 4,000 years old. And they're, as you can see, these circular shaped enclosed deposits where the outer portion is made up of mollusks and bone, uh, pottery and other artifacts and soil. And the interior, as you can see, is mostly cleared. So because of this shape, um, one of the big debates about these sites has been whether they were residential sites, people sort of living in circles and then throwing um, their food garbage um, outside and then it just naturally forms in these circles or whether they were um, intentionally sort of built this way um, and whether people were living there every day or, um, or if they were just reserved for having ceremonies um, and rituals. But the consensus now is likely that they were both. So just like today, though maybe not in these times, um, we have traditional gatherings in our homes with lots of people. Um, but that's also where we live and, and carry out our daily activities. So I am going to, I'm going to have to move my camera because the tray I have is a bit heavy to pick up. Um, so I'm going to turn this around. And so I'm going to show you what those deposits look like after they've been excavated, cleaned, and sorted into taxonomic groups. So we have bone here, so this is fish bone. This is actually catfish um, coming from these sites. We have crab. Um, we have a fish uh, mullet, a very small mullet. Um, but like I said, most of this is actually shell. So that's why this tray is so heavy. So we have oysters here. We have clams, um, different kinds of gastropods and barnacles, and then just piles of 
undifferentiated shell. Um, and so <laughs> these are very heavy, lots of work to sort out all of these and lots of work to differentiate um, all of these different um, shells and types of bone. And I'll just leave it on here for a little bit so you can kind of get um, another view. So as a zooarchaeologist, one of my jobs is to identify all of these down to species uh, when possible and use that data with other data sets um, like the ceramics and other artifacts I mentioned before and to address questions about what life was like in the past. And I'll turn my camera around and Chelsea, if you'll share the next slide. Um, so one of the things that we do and the way that we get at those questions is we take those archaeological fragments I just showed you and we'll compare them to modern specimens. So there I'm looking at a cow, though that wouldn't come from, from this site, um, but we use those modern comparatives um, to compare all of these little fragments and when possible we like to identify those down to species. And some of the types of questions we can address with um, these types of samples is first, most basically what people were eating how they were preparing foods and maybe where they were acquiring some of these resources. Um, but we can also look at things like what were the significance of uh, these animals to people. And uh, so basically, how did these animals fit into people's daily lives and what were their different purposes or significance? We can also use this type of information more broadly and we can look at questions associated with things like environmental change. Um, and animal conservation, preserving, and bi uh, preserving biodiversity. Um, as an example, uh, one of the aspects of my research actually looks at what seasons of the year people might have collected oysters. And so since shell rings are made up primarily of oysters, focusing just on, on that species could give me some idea as to when during the year people were using these sites, um, other potential uses, and maybe differences in use um, over time. So to do that, I needed to collect modern oysters as a baseline to compare to the archeological ones. And, and so this is just me collecting oysters in the marshes of St. Catharines. Um, and to do that, I get what we call these, temp we, what we can call temperature readings from oyster shells. And that will tell me what the water temperature was when the oyster died. Um, so can you go to the next slide? And I do that by sampling for stable isotopes. So this is a photo of an oyster that's been cut in half. Um, and it shows the sampling spots where I would actually drill out shell with an instrument called a micro mill. And it looks like a, a big microscope and it's got a drill on it. And so I just put this, the oyster sample on the stage of, of that big microscope and line it up and put all the points on, on there and then it would shell, uh, drill um, the shell out. And so what I found from this research is that most of the oysters were collected um, during the winter and spring season, so during cool months. I haven't found very many oysters that were collected uh, in, the, in the summer. And so that's important for a number of reasons, but one is that since they were using so many oysters, people collecting them may have been practicing a form of oyster population management. So by restricting that collection to a certain time of the year, that would give oyster beds a chance to regenerate before the next large, large harvest. So we can use information like that and to think about how we manage uh, animal populations today. So oyster populations are declining worldwide. Um, so these, type of, these types of data are things that we can use to sort of inform the way um, we practice uh, animal conservation and population management now. Um, so I'll end on that and I'll just say that as you probably noticed, uh, this research um, actually cuts across scientific disciplines. So I get to do archaeology and anthropology and I get to do some um, form of biological science as well. So, and that's one of the reasons it's so appealing for me. Thank you so much, Nicole. I think environmental archaeology was something I didn't learn about until I started working at the museum. Um, and I love that it crosses over so many different disciplines um, and that you can learn so much about humans by looking at oysters. Um, so neat. Um, and with that, I want to turn it over to Carmi, who can tell us some awesome things we can learn from fossils. 
Yeah, thanks, Chelsea. So, hey, everyone, welcome to the Invertebrate Paleontology Collection. I'm not within our actual collection space. That's in a door that I'm sort of looking at, but y'all can see today. Um, I'm sitting in our preparatory lab, which is where specimens go before they're integrated into our museum collection. And I wanted to focus on this more so than the collections aspect of things because I find that it's not always obvious how the fossils from the field get to be in, utilized in research later on. So a lot of times people think that fossils come to us like this. So this is a whelk from the Playa Pleistocene. It's a few million years old. Looks pretty beautiful, like you can pick it up along the beach today. And it's a nice condition. You don't really have to do a lot with it. Um, I washed it a little, I washed it down a little bit using some sieves to get out the sediment and whatnot for another project that I'm working on. But there's not too much work involved with this. Something like this echinoid, however, right here, which I started preparing yesterday, it's from the intercoastal formation up in the Florida Panhandle, requires a little bit more work before it can be integrated into our museum collection and utilized on research. And to prepare fossils, there's a many, many, many different tools that we can use, and I can't comprehensively cover them in our discussion today, but I can highlight a few of the ones that I use with more frequency. So sometimes my colleagues and I will joke that we're in a dentist's office just based on the sound, but also some of the equipment. So to brush off sediment, I use a highly specialized toothbrush um, to just gently brush it off. If it's relatively unconsolidated, you can get it off. Um, I also use a dental pick if I need a little bit more strength. Um, and sometimes use with caution the tweezers to remove either hardened pieces of sediment or large amounts of unconsolidated <laughs> consolidated sediment at one time. If you need a little bit more strength and power, you can use a carbide tip, which can go through rock, but it can also go through your hand pretty easily, so use with caution. Um, and I wanted to pull the focus a little bit onto a specimen that's near and dear to my heart and also significant to our geological and paleontological history here in Florida. And that is the mud crab, Ocalina floridana. So this is one that I prepared myself a couple of months ago, pre-pandemic. As you can see, you have the, the carapace and many of the arms associated with it. So this is a relatively nice specimen. And it was found here in Alachua County, about 45 minutes to the west of us in a quarry, which unfortunately I can't take folks to at this point in time, or even quite generally, because um, mining quarries are very dangerous places and they're under federal jurisdiction. So you need training and someone who's experienced to take you in. Um, you don't want to be wandering around there by yourself. So lots of heavy equipment, explosives, uh, other stuff you don't really want to find yourself getting into. But there are also lots of cool fossils like the stone crab right there. Um, as part of the family or Piliidae, so if you know anything about crabs, that will give you <laughs> some more information about some of its relatives. Um, it's also pretty unique because of the name, and I say that because it was described by the first female curator of invert zoology at the National Museum of Natural History, Mary Jane Rathbun. So she started out as a secretary and a typologist and sort of worked her way up into being a big systematics worker. Um, and systematics is sort of a specialized term that we give to folks who assign names to living or fossil organism. And that's a highly simplified definition, but just you want to use that later. Um, another interesting thing about the Ocalina floridana is the geologic unit in which it's located in, the Ocala limestone, which you can find a lot around North Florida and Central Florida um, and in Gainesville. So it's important commercially for road base a lot of times we joke that when you drive along a highway in Florida, you're driving along the Florida Fossil Highway um, because a lot of the material for those roads is derived from quarries like the one I talked about more recently. Um, it's also interesting to think about because while we're located in a terrestrial setting today, we're all standing on land about 30 million years ago in the Eocene, we would have been underwater in a beautiful shallow marine setting with corals and scallops and oysters. And in some ways, I think that would be a little more ideal, especially in the hot summer months. Um, 
that's another fascinating aspect of it as well. So a lot of times people, at least I definitely thought that Florida is not a huge place for paleontology, but in fact, we have a vast diversity of fossils and creatures from many different units of time. Um, and in this area is where we get to prepare them a little bit more and get them ready for study by other folks. So just a brief introduction to how fossils get prepared and then integrated into research later on. And Chelsea has a few additional images I sent her to share, I believe. Um, yeah, here we go. So this, and it, this is an example of a very well prepared Ocalina floridana. So you can see the underside of the carapace and the two major claws. This is an example of one of the images we have in our invert paleontology image galleries. So a lot of people use them for identifying fossils that they find around the state. Um, some of them also use these pictures for artistic purposes. So if they're doing a painting or designing pottery. So the vast majority of our specimens are used for research and answering those big questions, but they have other applications as well. And um, this is an example of one of my favorite crabs, again, the Ocalina floridina mud crab in the back. Um, that's one that one of my supervisors prepared who's been working on these units for about 40 years. And you can see that the qualities may be not as good as the first one, but it's still pretty incredible. It looks like it's sleeping in this photograph. Um, and I think we have, yes, we have one more and you have the rapidograph pen for scale so you can get another sense of the side of the size of these crabs. So if you've ever had blue crabs to eat over the summer, that's about the size that most of our Ocalina floridanus are. And this was um, the crab that I showed you all earlier and I can show you all again right now um, in previous day. Awesome, thank you so much, Carmi. And thank you to all of you for showing us what kind of stuff you have going on in your labs right now. Um, so before we move on to q and I'm wondering, um, since it's not every, well, it's, it's maybe every day for me to have four awesome scientists at my disposal. <laughs> Luckily, I have lots of scientists at my disposal, but it's not every day that our audience gets four amazing women scientists in front of them um, to ask questions. Um, but before we go on to audience questions, I was wondering if all of you have a little bit of advice you might want to share for any future scientists or any of the science curious folks that took our poll at the beginning. Um, and I'm going to start back with Pam again. Great. Thanks, Chelsea. So I'm guessing that a lot of our audience members are interested in science or in becoming a scientist. And I'll be really interested to see the result of that poll that we asked a little bit ago. And if that's the case, my advice is to follow your dream. If you want to be a scientist, go after it, do it. But also recognize that the path may be um, a little circuitous. You may not know exactly where you want to go and where you start out might not be where you end up. And that's all totally fine because we learn all sorts of things along the way. But the other point I want to make is that many of you may already be scientists and just don't know it. So do you collect rocks or fossils or shells or feathers or plants or butterflies? And if so, there may be a job waiting for you in a museum. So you may be doing science already and just don't even know about it. It's also possible for members of the community without formal training in science to contribute to science projects through something called citizen science. And citizen scientists around the world are really contributing huge amounts of data to a lot of different types of research projects, including projects that are taking place here at the Florida Museum. There are citizen science opportunities available for people of all ages with all sorts of interests. So you might want to check the museum's website for opportunities and stay tuned for opportunities in our community or other things that might just be available online. And finally, just enjoy science, whether as a profession or as a hobby. Thanks, Chelsea. Yeah, thank you so much, Pam. Um, and I'm going to start another poll because I'm curious about um, one more thing from you guys, wondering what your favorite thing to observe is. Um, and while you're answering this poll, um, Sarah, could, do you mind telling us a little bit of advice you might have for scientists? 
Yeah, sure thing. Thanks, Chelsea. And thank you, Pam. I think a lot of what, um, what, what you said about the circuitous route to becoming a scientist certainly rings true for me. Um, but as far as how to get into science, I think one, of, one way it can start is really just looking and learning about the life that, that is around you. Um, really anywhere, no matter where you live, there are certainly lots of really cool plants and insects and birds and other animals um, that you can learn a lot about without taking classes. Um, or, or having any formal scientific training. Um, so there's a lot of really great tools for learning about this. Um, some of it can take the form of field guides. I did, um, uh, our helper bee dropped a couple of links to my favorite insect field guides in the chat a little while ago. Um, and, and I know it'll end up in the um, email you all get later. So field, having field guides is a really helpful one. There are lots of them for pretty much anything you would want um, to learn about um, for your local area. Another really great resource that you don't even need to buy a book for is called iNaturalist. Um, and so on iNaturalist, you can take a video, a video, a photo, or even a sound recording of a plant or an animal or fungus that you see near you and upload it um, and potentially get some help identifying it. Um, and it's almost a cool way of collecting living organisms um, in digital form. Um, in addition, if you're specifically interested in insects, um, you can actually collect your own insects pretty easily. Um, all you need is a net or some other way to collect them, a jar, um, and you can either decide to let them go after you're done observing them, or you can um, kill them and keep them in a box um, so you can admire them later. A lot of really important work gets done um, by looking at what we call specimens of insects. Um, I, ha I happen to have a box of butterfly specimens right behind me. Um, so yeah, that would be my advice is just learn, learn more about what you find right in your backyard, especially right now as many of us are staying closer to home. Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. And you mentioned um, the email that I'll be sending out later. And I saw a question. I'm trying not to look at the chat too much because it's distracting. But I did see one question that I thought I could address right now, which is, yes, this whole program is being recorded right now. And so we will be able to send you this recording as well as all these amazing resources um, early next week. So now that we've addressed that, I'm hoping that um, Nicole can give us a little bit of advice from her experiences as a scientist. Sure, I would definitely agree with the securitous route because that was true for me also. So, but that's uh, that's not a bad thing. Um, it meant that I liked a whole lot of different things and a lot of things were interesting to me, which meant there were a whole lot of options for me. So I think that's uh, probably a good way to look at it. It's not that you need to decide right away. So take time to figure out what it is that you like and figure out what suits you best and have some fun adventures along the way while you do it and don't stress out about getting to an endpoint because it's likely going to be very different from <laughs> what you thought it was. Thanks, Nicole. I love permission to have adventures for sure. <laughs> um, Carmi, what do you got for us? Oh, wow. This is always so difficult because I feel I get so much good advice. I'm very fortunate to have a wide range of mentors and supervisors both here at the museum and at elsewhere. Um, so kind of part one is develop a, a broad network of people who can support you. So both in your personal life and in professional life, within your institution and outside of your institution. Um, there's been a lot of really great advice about the circuitous route. So I would kind of add to that and say that comparison is the theft of joy. It's very tempting, especially in academic settings, to compare yourself, you know, when you're a graduate student against your fellow graduate students, your cohort. Um, and your professional job against other professionals in the field or faculty against other faculty members. But everyone is different. Everyone brings a unique set of skills and experiences to their science and, and what they're working on. Um, and a guaranteed way to be unhappy in whatever you do is to be constantly looking at everyone else um, in, in their journeys in that sense of just, oh, I'm, I'll never be good enough. I'll never get this grant. I'll never get this position. Um, that's just not a good way to live. You know, focus on yourself and enjoy your route. Um, and kind of the third dimension, which is what I wish I had known earlier on, is if there's somebody whose work you respect and admire and would be interested in learning more about, just shoot them an email. 
Um, or if you're very bold, give them a phone call if their phone number is around. Um, I field a good amount of phone calls to our collection for people asking, hey, what's this? Or can you tell me more about this fossil I found? Um, a guy uh, excavating a quarry in South Florida gave me a call and said, I've been finding all these big shells everywhere. Can you tell me more? Like, how old are they? Where are they found? Because um, scientists love talking about their work generally, and they love sharing these experiences with other people. So don't be afraid or intimidated to reach out. Um, the worst that I find is no response. Um, it's very rare that there's an unpleasant or terrible response, but that reflects more of the person than it does you. Just pick yourself up and keep going. So that's my three-part mini advice for, for y'all today. I love that, Carmi. Thank you. I kind of want to start a like ask Carmi um, advice column because <laughs> you have been given us so much um, important things to remember. Um, and I kind of want to thank all of you for that advice and then also add my own, which is um, for anyone who, you know, you feel like you're already in your career, you're not, you're not planning on becoming a professional scientist anytime soon. Um, I want to encourage you to be curious about your world and continue learning about it, um, even as a non-professional. Um, and always, like Carmi said, like, feel free to reach out and ask questions to scientists that are in your community. Um, these are just four of them here, but there are so many more. Um, if you're on social media, there's tons of awesome scientists on Twitter. Um, you can always reach out, ask questions that way. Um, and just to quote one of my favorite science communicators and um, podcast host Ellie Ward is to ask smart people stupid questions. So don't be afraid to ask those questions. Um, and with that, I'm going to share with you guys a slide here of um, all of the um, Twitter accounts for our scientists that are on our panel today. So you guys um, can, you know, we'll have this in the recording as well. But these are some of the ways that you can reach out to them and follow their work um, in their labs even after this event. Um, and then now I'm gonna share with you a little bit more about our upcoming events with the NEA Big Read. Um, and while I'm doing this, I hope that all of you are thinking of your questions because we do have some time for some questions afterwards. So I, I hope that all of you take some, um, take some time to think about those questions because why wait to reach out to them later if you have all four of them on your panel right now? So um, don't be afraid to ask those questions um, and I'll be moderating that section too. Um, so while you think about that, I'm going to let you know about our next event, which is Fieldwork Fails. Um, this is slide and the next one are both events um, targeted towards the grown-ups in the audience. Um, but Fieldwork Fails is our live storytelling event. Um, we've done this event in the past here at the museum, but it gives our scientists an opportunity to tell their um, true personal um, stories of doing field work and about all those times that just didn't go quite as planned. Um, our scientists here talked about going on their circuitous routes through their career, um, but there are also lots and lots of stories that they, they haven't told here and that we have more scientists to tell later about those um, kind of slip ups that might happen in science and everything that we can learn from them. So this event will actually be um, this upcoming Thursday, the 24th at 7 p.m. Um, and this is um, another virtual event. So in the past, this has been a paid event that is sells out super fast, but this is our first time we're offering it free and virtual. So make sure you register for that as well. Um, and then upcoming in October, November will be our first um, meetups for Lab Girl. So this is the book by Hope Joren that the whole um, NEA um, program is kind of um, partnering with. So our first meetup will be October 13th, and then we'll have another, another one at November 17th. Um, and these book meetups are going to be a little different than your average book club because I do have scientists attending both of these. So you'll have an opportunity to the, discuss the book about a scientist um, with scientists from the museum there. Um, and we'll also have some help from the Lasher County Library because I'm not going to talk about books without them. Um, and it's going to be a super awesome opportunity um, to, you know, kind of build community and, and talk about a book. One of my favorite things to do. Um, and for those of you that have little ones that are watching with you, you may have seen that we are doing another event in December. Um, so December 5th at 10 a.m. and we'll have the Swimming with Sharks meetup. Um, and this will be similar. We'll be able to talk a little bit about the book with our littlest um, scientist. Um, and I also have two marine biologists that are going to be there to answer questions about what it's like to study sharks. 
um, which is really, really cool. Um, and so we have those um, four events coming up and then we'll have some more that you can find out about on our website up in 2021, but I didn't want to overwhelm you guys with uh, 2021 dates just yet. <laughs> um, so with that said, um, thank you all for attending. We're going to take some questions now. Um, so make sure you're adding those to the chat. Um, and then I am going to put all of us, um, myself and the scientist on gallery view. Hopefully you can see them all here. Um, and we will answer some of your questions. So as I bring up the question page, um, my first question we have, um, okay, so I have one for Sarah. Um, Sarah, are you ready to answer a question about caterpillars? <laughs> sure thing. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the swallowtail caterpillars? Do they all look like bird poop or just that particular one? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, the answer is no, they don't all look like poop. Um, so different caterpillars, just like lots of animals, have different what we call defense strategies. So camouflage can be one of those strategies, um, like the caterpillar we saw a little bit earlier that looks like bird poop. Um, and there are other swallowtail, it's not just the shouse swallowtail butter, butterflies caterpillar that looks like bird poop. Um, others do as well, including um, one that's more common um, in the southeast called the giant swallowtail. Um, if folks um, find a caterpillar on an orange tree or other uh, or a lime tree, it probably is a giant swallowtail. Um, so that's one way to get a really good look at another caterpillar that looks like bird poop. But to actually answer the question, no, they do not all look like bird poop. Um, so other caterpillars, instead of defending themselves by camouflaging or looking like something that's not so tasty will look like something that's dangerous. So there are other swallowtail caterpillars that actually mimic snakes. Um, so they'll have spots that look like eyes and when they're, when they're disturbed or bothered, some of them will rear up and they will avert um, these little structures called osmeteria that are on their head. They're these little, they almost look like little horns. Um, and so it, the sudden movement is thought to scare predators. Some people think they look like a snake tongue. Um, and also they smell really bad, um, which probably deters predators as well. So those are just a couple of the defenses that these caterpillars have. Um, that I could go on for a whole, a whole lot more time. There's all sorts of different defenses that insects have. That's awesome. Um, Pam, this question um, is about plant collecting. So when you, you showed us your plant press there, um, and I'm wondering if when you go out into the field, do you carry that big plant press with you? How do you bring plants from the outdoors back to your lab safely? So um, that's a really great question. And um, it depends a little bit on the um, sort of work that we're doing and the size of the project. So for example, if we're doing field work at a nearby biological station, like something close to campus, we'll probably just go out and we'll collect things into a plastic bag and um, with a, maybe a damp paper towel to keep everything um, sort of moist and keep it from wilting. Maybe we'll put them all in a, in a cooler or something and we'll bring things right back to the lab and we'll press them when we get back here. But if we're out on a big trip and we're um, camping and you know doing a large scale collecting trip, uh, we'll have a lot of plant presses with us. Um, we'll also, you know, you might also even take a small generator along so that you can hook up a drying oven. This is really important, especially in places like the Southeast where, um, you know, it's always so humid, it's hard to get your samples dried. People in the tropics, well, if they're doing field work in the tropics might actually attach um, their plant presses to the top of their vehicle and try to um, get air movement as they're driving down the road. So there are a lot of strategies for that. But in those cases, you take a bunch of plant presses with you. You maybe go out and do a bit of collecting, bring it back to your campsite, and then um, do the pressing there. Because as you can imagine, as you get more and more specimens in that press, besides the presses get bigger and heavier um, as you go along. So Yeah, that's amazing especially after reading about some um, great biologists of the past, like Alexander von Humboldt, you know, climbing the mountains and collecting things. It's amazing how much um, the way that technology has changed has helped us collect in different ways, it sounds like. Really right. cool. Yeah, exactly, yeah, thanks. 
Um, Nicole, um, you may have answered this question a little bit in the chat, but I'm also wondering if you could speak out loud about um, the shell mound question. So someone asked, um, they know that there are shell mound islands in Florida, specifically in Southwest Florida, um, but can you tell us about some shell mounds that might exist in other parts of the world? Yeah, thanks for that, Sarah. Um, shell mounds and archaeological sites in general are actually found all over the world. Um, some of them you can see above ground. Um, you may be able to see uh, mounds like at Cahokia or some of the ones that are that are um, made in the shapes of animals. And some, uh, like the shell rings that I work on, you may just be able to see a little bit poking out of the surface and kind of follow that along and, and find out um, where the margins of that site are, but they're actually found all over the world. That's so cool. Um, how about this question? Um, okay, Carmi, there's kind of two questions for you. Um, the first is probably a little easier. Um, so if someone's wondering about the image gallery um, that you mentioned, is that available for the general public to view? Yeah, absolutely. I think Amy dropped the link in the chat awesome. a little bit earlier. Yeah, and that can also be sent out with the resources later. Cool, perfect. Um, and then the next question is, so what made you be interested in invertebrates versus, you know, you hear a lot of paleontologists, you know, they they just want to study the, the big megafauna like dinosaurs or mammoths, that kind of thing. So what got you into kind of the smaller stuff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's always a little bit of a feud between the invertebrate people and the vertebrate people, which is generally friendly. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm biased towards invertebrate now because that's my field. Um, the person who trained me during my undergraduate in education was also an invertebrate paleontology, so I did have that influence shaping me even from then. But I find that the questions that you're able to ask with the invertebrate fossil record are sometimes a little bit more towards my area of interest. You can have larger data sets and make more um, nuanced comparisons. So for vertebrates, you might find a handful of bones here or there, but with invertebrates, it's the entire animal. And I find that a little more interesting. Um, not that I don't like, you know, dinosaurs a little bit and mammals a little bit, but it just doesn't really uh, excite me as much as the invertebrates do. That makes sense. I mean, everybody has, has their favorites. Um, so I have a question um, that I love um, in I'm not quite sure who wants to answer it, but um, someone is asking if you can name a favorite discovery or connection that you've kind of come to in your research. So if not a discovery, but maybe your favorite um, aha moment that you've had in your science. Can anyone think of anything? <laughs> so I can take a stab at that, um, if that's okay. Yeah, go for it. I think you've had a lot of great moments. I've been at it a lot longer in the research. Really <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I always think is interesting by um, from sort of with a question like that is that the way that science is often portrayed is that um, you're just working along, working along, working along, and all of a sudden it's like, wow, I just discovered something. And it would be really great if it worked that way. But most of the time what happens is it's like a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And it's not until you start putting a lot of little pieces together that you actually realize that you have sort of discovered something. And, um, you know, it would be great if it was like, you know, how things are portrayed um, in movies and things. But, um, but it's actually a lot of very slow, small steps that actually get us to that point. But one example that um, turns out now to have been, um, you know, a, a really cool thing that happened to us was that we were working on building this plant branch of the tree of life, this big family tree. And um, people, you know, this was actually about 25 years ago now. We were on sabbatical at the Smithsonian and we decided to include some samples that we found in the freezer there. So we had some samples that people hadn't ever put into the sort of analysis that we do. and We added them in and this one plant that occurs only on the island of New Caledonia, which is a small island, um, well, not super small, but you know, a, an isolated island that's about a thousand miles off the coast of Australia. 
It only occurs there, it's a shrub. And it turned out that it was in this really important position in the family tree um, where it connects to like the base of the family tree. And what this then, and so for people who know about the duck-billed platypus, you might know that, um, that that's sort of um, a really important um, animal um, relative to the rest of mammals. Well, this one plant called Amborella has the same position relative to the rest of the flowering plants. And now that plant is, is being used for all sorts of studies to understand what the earliest flowering plants were like. But it was totally serendipity. If we hadn't found the DNA sample in the freezer, we would have never put it in the analysis and we wouldn't have figured this out. And um, you know, and again, this was all big teamwork, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a process, definitely a process. That's amazing story. I love it. <laughs> um, and then I have a question, Carmi, what do you think um, the oldest fossil that you found or the coolest fossil that you've ever found might be? <laughs> or coolest to you? I know that that's kind of a... <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That's so difficult. Um... <laughs> Because there's so many different uh, directions that I can think about. I mean, I like a lot of the sort of few million year old fossils a lot because those environments are fairly similar to the ones that we have today. And so we can kind of look to the past to help us think about what we're going to be experiencing in the future. Um, I would say, though, lately, some of my favorite fossils have been these renated crabs, when they're commonly called frog crabs from the same site that this, again, echinoid is from up in the kind of panhandle area, the intercoastal formation. So they're just these really funky looking crabs. They're very difficult to prepare, um, but we CT'd some of them in the micro CT scanner last year. And so I've been working on reconstructing some of those. So it's just kind of crabs that are unusual, that are fairly young, that are here in Florida, that's kind of been what I've been excited about lately, but that will probably change in a month, right? I'll have some new favorite fossil just because we have uh, six and a half million specimens here. So a lot to think about and choose from. Yeah, that's, it's got to be hard to choose when you have so many to choose from. <laughs> I can't even pick a favorite color most days. <laughs> um, Nicole, this question's for you and hopefully isn't too difficult of a question, but someone was asking what the diameter of those shell rings might be. So science question for you. Oh yeah, so they they actually um, vary. Um, so like how wide uh, across they are. Um, so those two shell rings are about the same, um, are about the same uh, diameter and I believe they're around um, five meters on the inside. Um, so that, so as the circle goes, so that long around. So yeah, but others, um, those are relatively, um, those are sort of medium sized compared to other shell rings and sort of, and not very deep. So they go down about a meter deep, both of those. And there are others that are, that are much, much taller. Um, so they actually vary in size and in shape. And some of them actually, um, some of the sites in the, in that same category um, are not totally enclosed. So the ones in Georgia and, and in South Carolina, those are actually mostly totally enclosed. And then the ones that we call shell rings in Florida are actually horseshoe shaped. So they actually vary only in, they vary in size and in, um, in uh, shape. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask one more question, um, and this is going to be to everyone um, before we wrap it up today. Um, so my last question here to everyone is, um, since this whole program with the NEA, we're all talking about the book Lab Girl, and we're, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, we want to highlight um, women in science. Um, so my question to you guys is, um, to have you, that you can kind of answer one, one way or another. So um, the question in the chat was, have you been met with resistance in the field because you're a woman? Um, but also if you would prefer to answer my question, which is um, why do you think we should highlight the work of women in science? Um, so either have you been met with resistance and how have you um, dealt with that? Or why do you think that um, highlighting women in science is something that we should be doing. Um, does anyone want to take a stab at that?
<laughs> it's a tough question. Um, I mean, I can start I as the um, program organizer and and one of the people that you know worked to get us this grant to highlight women in science. Um, I think that it's important to highlight women in all fields, but um, especially science. Um, because there has been a lot of scientists in the past that maybe we don't even know about their work. Um, I've participated in activities, you know, where you ask people to name five scientists in, you know, people struggle. They name five scientists and they're all men and it's hard to get the names of the women scientists. So for a long time throughout history, it's been, it's been difficult for women to get credit in their science. Um, and now in 2020, where science is so important to everything that we do and decisions that are being made, um, I think it's really important to have women involved in those discussions um, and telling their stories as well, um, like we're doing here today. So that's kind of my piece. Um, do any of our scientists have anything that you'd like to add to that? I could maybe just add a few comments as well. I think everything you just said was um, really important. But I think um, one of the other reasons why it's important to highlight the work of women scientists is, well, first of all, just to make sure that they get the credit that they deserve for the work that they've done um, over the, the past, actually, centuries, uh, where women were contributing a lot to science but haven't necessarily received credit. And the reason for that, the, the reason why I think that's so important is that um, we don't want girls growing up now to think that only boys and men can be scientists because what we know from new science is that the best science is done by diverse teams and if we don't have voices from from men and from women and from people of color and from various backgrounds and disciplines and perspectives we can't do this do science as well as we could if we combine all of those different perspectives so it's incredibly important for personal credit and also um, just for the promise of science into the future. That's awesome. And I hope we have some young scientists that are here listening today that are inspired by that. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that question? Not yet? All right. Well, that's, I'm sure we'll leave you thinking about your answers to that after this event. Um, so with that, I wanted to thank everyone so much for attending today, our kickoff event. Um, I hope you'll register for our other events that we have going on in this series. Um, this is just the first of many, um, lots of awesome things to come. Um, if you haven't already picked up a copy of one of our books that we're reading with part of the NEA Big Read, um, remember that those are available at the Lacho County Library. Um, and if you don't have a library card, you can get one and get that awesome poster that Jasmine showed at the beginning. So. Um, lots of cool perks going on with that. Um, oh, you see, scientists have library cards too. So here's Sarah showing hers off. <laughs> um, easy access. Um, and with that, I'm going to remind all of you to please take the survey that um, Amy is going to drop right there in the chat. Oh, she just did it. That's awesome. Um, and just a reminder that I'll be sending you all an email um, that will have a recording of this event as well as a list of the resources that we've shared here today um, that should be coming to your inbox probably um, early to mid next week we got to make sure that the recording is in good shape and we got captions for all of you so um, thanks for listening and thanks for attending and thanks for participating to our scientists um, have a good weekend everyone